Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today and welcome to our first installment of the alumni webinar series. We are very excited to have alumni from across the country joining us today. My name is Amanda Henty and I'm the Alumni Professional Development Coordinator here at St. Louis University. I started my role in July 2015 and since then I have been working on establishing and strengthening alumni professional development programming. This webinar series is a part of that initiative and we're hoping to be able to offer a new webinar presentation quarterly. Our presentation today will be recorded and available for viewing later this week on our main SLU YouTube page. And I will be sending an, out an email to you when that is available later this week. Throughout the presentation today, the chat feature will be available for you to send questions and we will be answering as many questions as possible at the end of the presentation. Throughout the presentation, if you have any technical issues, we ask that you contact GoToWebinar directly at 1-805-617-7370. And I will also add this phone number to the chat section of our webinar for your reference if needed. So now I would like to introduce our speaker today, Beth Ann Yakabu. She is a 2009 Business School alum and also currently the executive, executive director of the Emerson Leadership Institute here at SLU. Welcome, Beth Ann. Thank you, thank you, Amanda, and thank you, and thank you all for participating in our session today on the topic of ethical leadership. It is my pleasure to be your presenter. As Amanda mentioned, my name is Beth Ann Yakabu, and I'll start by saying that I am a proud alumna of two Jesuit institutions. I have an undergrad degree in finance from Georgetown University, and in 2009, I earned my MBA right here at St. Louis University. After 17 years working in different leadership positions in both the financial services and talent management sectors in Washington, D.C., I returned to St. Louis to pursue my MBA, which led me to a new career in higher education. In 2010, I helped launch a brand new center at SLU, the Center for Sustainability, as its assistant director. After several years, I assumed a new role at the university when I was promoted to Director of Corporate and Foundation Relations. And in 2015, I had the privilege of being selected to lead the new Emerson Leadership Institute as the Executive Director. So I'd like to share just a little bit about the Emerson Leadership Institute. Eli, as we call it, is one of the four centers of distinction in the John Cook School of Business here at SLU. Our mission is to develop and deliver education, research, and community engagement programs that shape and enable ethical leaders. As we strive toward our vision to cultivate ethical leaders who will improve the quality of all life on earth. The Institute is the next evolution of a 27-year partnership between Emerson and the John Cook School of Business. Formerly the, ethics, the Emerson Ethics Center, the center focused on incorporating ethics into the business curriculum and providing experiential learning opportunities for undergrad and grad students. In 2015, Eli was established as a leadership hub that supports impactful academic programs, leading edge research initiatives, and market-driven community engagement activities where ethics and responsible leadership are core tenants. As our scope has expanded to also support the professional business market, we've begun building a suite of ethics and compliance oriented certificate programs, including a certificate in sustainable business leadership. We conduct corporate consulting, leadership training, and executive education. Recently, we developed a unique program called the Pastoral Institute of Leadership for, for Archdiocesan priests who are a couple years out of seminary. We provide financial, management, and leadership instruction in a hybrid classroom format that helps prepare them to take on the daunting responsibility of managing a church. Okay, so I'd like to share what our goals are for today. First, we'll explore the concept of ethical leadership. 
Then we'll identify the correlation between ethical leadership and Jesuit values. We'll then highlight alumni who exemplify those values. And lastly, we'll take a look at how we can further our personal commitment to promoting ethical leadership. All right, we have a lot to cover over the next 45 minutes. So without further ado, let's move forward. Okay. As a launching pad for our discussion, let's establish a point of reference for the notion of leadership as the term means a variety of things to different people. This is just a sampling of, descript of descriptors that we see here. So we see values, purpose, determination, principles, developing followership, building consensus, being a servant, having humility, being experienced, having integrity. All of these descriptors add to the complexion and complexity of leadership. Yet when you distill the term down to its most common denominator, it simply describes someone who influences. So who comes to mind when you think of leaders? Perhaps our first thought will take us to a popular, famous person. Or I'm sure many of us here on the call will think about a social justice pioneer, perhaps our beloved Jesuit Pope, Pope Francis, Mother Teresa, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., and Gandhi are classic and timeless examples of mission-oriented leaders. Now Malala has joined their ranks. Undoubtedly, we don't have difficulty thinking of at least one powerful corporate executive or global political figure. While we may consider each of these examples as leaders, there are some who we might say faced moral failures or made unethical decisions. Again, the common core that ties each of these individuals is the impact and influence they possess or have possessed over some segment of society. Interestingly, we don't usually make a point of calling them influential leaders, as that would be redundant. All leaders are influential, whether it's a positive or a negative impact. Why then do we make a distinction by saying ethical leader? Why is it essential that we qualify the term leadership by adding the word ethical? Isn't that an integral characteristic of a leader? And don't we expect that our leaders will behave ethically? So I'd like to hear from you. In your chat box, please take a moment and jot down a word or two that describes ethical leadership to you. And while you're doing that, I'll just say a few more words. That given the climate we live in, with social scandal, with corporate scandals and other epic ethical failures being commonplace, there is a need to make that distinction. We've seen corporate executives who are considered great leaders because they meet their profit projections or because their companies are iconic brands, but they are leaders who have accomplished their goals or some have by not using ethical strategies or tactics. I mean, we don't have to look far to identify the examples. Wells Fargo, Volkswagen, Takata, and here recently, Fox News and United Airlines. So let's hear some of your responses. Amanda? Okay, thank you everyone for your responses. They're slowly rolling in. I'll just read some of them so far. We've had wise, um, leadership focused on the common good, other person focused, moral compass, confident, honesty, passion, and courage. Awesome. That, that Those are great. If I could just add a couple more ideas to the mix. I mean, all of those uh, descriptors are excellent in describing ethical leadership. And someone mentioned moral compass. An ethical leader possesses a moral compass. There's someone who sets an example 
of ethics and realizes that their actions are copied by their employees. They are ethically, they act ethically as an inspiration to others. They promote and reward ethical actions while they condemn unethical actions. They commu communicate and manage their organization's culture and they take time to self-reflect and course correct when necessary. They ask themselves, would I follow myself? So let's look at these characteristics in a little more detail. Self-awareness. Self-awareness is essential because no one can begin to lead others until they know themselves and have the capacity to govern themselves appropriately. Ethical leaders possess a keen knowledge of their own character, feelings, motives, and desires. They understand their strengths and weaknesses and how to use their strengths to their advantage and the advantage of their organizations while acknowledging and compensating for their areas of weakness by developing personal capacity and proactively building capacity within their leadership ranks to ensure a full complement of skills necessary for a healthy organization. Ethical leaders model ethical behavior. We express our values through our actions. Therefore, if a leader is ethical, he or she will treat the members of the organization with respect, fairness, equity, and compassion. The most basic and obvious sign of ethical behavior is shown by how people treat others. Ethical leaders respect people, all people, regardless of whether they are the same at the same organizational level or a subordinate, or whether they are the, whether or not they are the same gender, ethnicity or religion, whether they attended the same or competing high school. That's a joke, but the native St. Louis is on the line. But we get the point though, that no one is better or more important than another and everyone deserves respect and to be treated fairly. This moral tone is established at the topmost level by the leader's behavior, not just by the code of ethics, that hangs on the wall or the employee handbook or that is written in the employee handbook. The ethical leader sets other ethical norms for the organization as well, such as corporate social responsibility, sustainability, excellence in quality and service, and asks the question, what does our organization stand for? He or she then communicates those norms and does it with the intensity to which they will uphold them. A tangible way in which leaders accomplish this is by establishing a code of ethics and, employ and employment practices consistent with the organization's mission and overall goals. Next, open communication and transparency. Ethical leaders provide staff the information they need to make decisions. But even more, they are, they are open in their communication to build trust, ease tension, and demonstrate the worth placed on the individual. That staff are not just cogs in a wheel, but integral, valuable assets of the organization. I'd like to use a, a good example of open communication that's close to home for those of us here at SLU the Majus Operational Excellence Initiative. Our university leadership knew that we were facing a tough road ahead, that difficult decisions were inevitable, that our community would be negatively impacted, at least in the short term. But from the onset, there has been open communication. The university community received letters from President Pestello, from Provost, Brookhouse and the Majus chairpersons. Established, they established a website that lists frequently asked questions, that outlines the strategic plan, project timelines, improvement focus areas, the names of all the steering committee members, and a call to action, 
an opportunity to submit feedback. Not only that, they held multiple open forums, giving the community the opportunity to ask questions in person. And moreover, they proactively addressed the matter with the media so that we could control the narrative. This is what I call good communication. For any organization, especially those going through times of change, leadership is prudent to keep communicate. It is leadership is prudent if they keep communication open and transparent. Closed communication, on the other hand, fosters fear, worry, anxiety, uncertainty, lack of trust, and stress, all of which translates into decreased productivity low morale, and potentially turnover. And that's just to speak of the internal erosion. Negativity rarely stays contained. It eventually bleeds outside the organization, leaving the organization susceptible to a damaged brand image, reputation, and competitive advantage. Because employees are not the only stakeholders that feel the effects of poor top-level communication. Op open communication is not just a skill a leader develops. It is an intention and an obligation leaders make to the organization because of the impact it has on the, on the bigger scheme of things. Lastly, accountability. Ethical leaders accept responsibility for the actions, policies, and consequences of their organization's behavior. They don't pass the blame nor do they pretend that, that the improprieties were perpetrated outside of their watch. They ask key questions. And not, is it legal, but is it fair? Is it right? Is it just? As I look at myself in the mirror, how would I assess my decision? How would my decision play out on the nightly news? And do I seek diverse voices for counsel? As examples of epic corporate failures and political improprieties across the globe arise nearly weekly, we're pretty clear that being a leader doesn't mean one necessarily acts ethically. Every organization, every leader faces ethical challenges. We've all read the scripture or have likely heard someone recite it. To whom much is given, much is required. There is a lot of pressure being at the helm of an organization because of the temptations of power and the weight of the implications of enterprise-wide decision-making. Despite their career success, leaders may be particularly vulnerable to ethical lapses. So let's look at a few of those common vulnerabilities that leaders face. Lack of reflection. This is one of the prime pitfalls. Leaders cannot effectively govern themselves unless they step back and evaluate the impact of their decisions. They need to gauge their frame of mind and they need to know when to exercise self-care. Self-reflection helps to reduce stress, which is very important because we don't always make the optimal choices when we're in stress mode. Overconfidence. Leaders are susceptible to overconfidence when they have enjoyed a track record of success, and even more so if they're renowned for it. Leaders who have expert knowledge in a particular area may feel that they know all the answers and that no one can question them, especially if they have uncritical support from those around them. Sense of entitlement. This is when leaders keep a larger portion of the resources to themselves rather than distributing them among the team. And lastly, the belief that the end justifies the means. This is the attitude that believes that rules are good, but one should not be bound by them. There are any number of executives who would likely testify that this is a myth because their company's brands have suffered severe damage due to their unethical actions. The risk of doing the wrong thing in the short term for a quick win 
is not a sustainable formula. In a recent Fortune magazine article entitled, United Debacle Shows What Business Schools Are Missing, the author asserts that business schools should teach business ethics and law to their students and not only concentrate on economic doctrines that drive profit over principle. As I read that article, I thought, yes, this is certainly true, but in this day and age, are there really business schools that haven't incorporated business ethics and law into their curriculum? If so, that's not only a gross oversight, but it is a huge disservice to their students. Our business school has been teaching and incorporating ethics into the curriculum for decades. And as a Jesuit institution, we are fortunate to have this important foundation laid to help, our, to help prime our students for the challenges that lie ahead. We're all familiar with the remarkable servant leader, founder St. Ignatius Loyola, a wounded soldier who became a pilgrim, a spiritual companion, and a priest with an insatiable desire to serve God and the church. In 1540, he set the Society of Jesus on its course with a vision to seek and find God in all things. For nearly 500 years, the Jesuits have been known for education, starting schools and seminaries across the globe, for caring for the whole person, mind, body, and spirit, and for striving to become well-rounded people who contribute to the greater good. Jesuit education is world-renowned for its highest quality of academic rigor, service to the communities in which they reside, and the well-rounded, socially and spiritually adept students they produce. As Father Kolvenbach, the 29th Superior General of the Society of Jesus summed it up, the real measure of our Jesuit university lie in who our students become. We're gonna take a look at how Jesuit education influences decision-making, especially when right and wrong isn't as clear as black and white, but it's more like a shade of gray. The mission of St. Louis University is the pursuit of truth for the greater glory of God and the service of humanity. Our mission eloquently states that we're not gaining knowledge to selfishly enlarge ourselves, but we have a goal which fulfills a higher purpose and a greater good. Ad majorum de glorium, which translated means for the greater glory of God, asks three questions. What have I done for Christ? What am I doing for Christ? And what will I do for Christ? The Bible records in Matthew 25, 40, that whatever you do for the least of your brother or sister, you do for Christ. Therefore, our mission encourages us to seek opportunities to make even the smallest gesture because it can be done to glorify God. Jesuit education does an excellent job of exposing students to values both in and outside the classroom. Our Jesuit values lead us down the path to ethical leadership. From finding God in all things, which cultivates not only a sense of purpose, but also an appreciation for the smallest things, both positive situations and those that may be disappointing. It reinforces the notion that God is at the center, not, our, not ourselves and therefore promotes a sense of awe and humility. As we discussed a little earlier, overconfidence and pride are pitfalls that leaders find themselves falling into. The Jesuit value of majus or more is the striving for excellence in all pursuits. We're trained to go deeper and think critically in order to solve problems creatively. As leaders, those are two of the most important skills, critical thinking and problem solving. As an ethical leader, we live out majus. As we live out majus, we bring glory to God and serve humanity. Self-reflection, 
Again, our Jesuit tradition sets us up for success. This is another tool that we have at our disposal to avoid the blind spots that cause uh, leaders to fail. Self-reflection leads to self-awareness, which is the starting point of ethical leadership. Without self-reflection, we miss finding God in all things because we're not taking the time to make those discoveries. discoveries. And neither are we making, having modest experiences because we're not taking the time to dig deeper and focus our minds to allow creativity to lead us to innovative solutions to problems. Mindfulness is a term many people I'm sure are familiar with. It's a fairly recent phenomenon that has made millions of people believers in the power of quiet, stillness, and reflection. Well, Ignatius instituted reflection in the 1500s, so that is not a, a new concept at all. Oops. All right, most of us I'm sure are familiar with the examine. It is one of the spiritual exercises that Ignatius developed to aid us in self-reflection. The five steps include asking God for light. I want to look at my day with God's eyes and not merely my own. Secondly, giving thanks for the gift of life. Then reviewing the day and contemplating what went right. Fourth, Face, facing shortcomings. What went wrong? What can I do differently? And lastly, looking toward the day, looking uh, forward to the next day and asking God where, where we should look for him or where we need him. Another key Jesuit value is cura personalis or, or care for the individual person which is the respect for the dignity of each person as a child of God. And finally, men and women for others, for and with others, speaks to how we have the power to make the world a better place by seeking justice and serving the most vulnerable among us. Coined by Father Pedro Arupe, this phrase envelops the heart of the Jesuit tradition. He said, we must become people who cannot even conceive of the love of God, which does not include love for the least of our neighbors. A Jesuit education encourages students to integrate contemplation and action so they become men and women with well-developed minds, generous hearts, and reflective souls, agents of change who work to bring about a more just, humane world. So we've highlighted some of the correct characteristics of ethical leaders, and we've reviewed several of the primary values of Ignatian spirituality. The correlation with the, between the two is quite clear. As we see here, our Jesuit values and how they align with ethical leadership. That when we find God in all things, we're experiencing humility and a sense of purpose. We see that Majus aligns with seeking and, and uh, seeking and, and striving for excellence and being responsible stewards. As we self-reflect, we grow in self-awareness. We set ourselves up to be um, the moral tone, to set the, a proper moral tone for the organization. Our values are highlighted and we exercise ethical behavior. Cura personalis, we respect all people, we treat others fair and equitably, and we're inclusive. And when we act as men and women for and with others, we're showing justice, service, support, and generosity. There are so many examples of ethical leaders among the ranks of St. Louis University alumni, from recent grads to golden Philicans and masses in between. Following are just a few highlights that demonstrate how a commitment to Jesuit values translates into ethical leadership. Dame Mary Bremer. Mary Bremer is an 
inspirational woman of faith and service who embodies the Jesuit mission. At 96 years old, she retired from SLU for the second time. For the past 26 years, she has served as a full-time volunteer, a role she chose after retiring for the first time after 35 years in university administration. Mary devoted her life and considerable gifts to serving and empowering people from the time she arrived as a student in 1938. She served tirelessly in her many leadership roles as the director of the first resident hall for women in 1956, and then the dean of women, the dean of student affairs, and by special invitation in 1985 from the Vice President for University Development as his special assistant for stewardship. She also founded the Women's Commission 44 years ago, and it's the longest continually operating Women's Commission at any U.S. university. For many years, she also served as the advisor for Alpha Sigma Nu, the Jesuit Honor Society. Last year, Mary was awarded a papal knighthood from Pope Francis and was named Dame Commander of the Order of St. Sylvester Pope and Martyr for her unwavering commitment of service to St. Louis University. Archbishop Robert Carlson of St. Louis presented her with the commemorative scroll and medallion from Rome. He said, Mary has been a role model a guiding light and a moral compass for generations of SLU students and alumni. John Cook School of Business alumnus, Tom Santel, believes that every person, every life is important. He exudes the essence of Cura Personalis, both in philosophy and in service. After 25 years as an executive at Anheuser-Busch, Tom retired from the company as the CEO of International and VP of Corporate Planning. Then he set his sights on using his expertise and talents to make a positive impact in the social realm. Aware that strategic planning and financial acumen are his strengths, Tom wanted to find an opportunity to marry those strengths with his passion for education and providing resources for children who live in tough circumstances. He recognized that we as a society can do better, a much better job of connecting the dots. There are so many good efforts and resources that are just not well coordinated. Tom stressed that so much of what happens to a person is a function of the circumstances of their birth. Every kid who is born has innate talents and it's up to society to invest as much as possible in every child. Otherwise, we're shortchanging ourselves as a society and we're shortchanging that person. Tom said that he always believed in education and young people. So he put his talents to bear in that area. He dedicated himself to a program at Harvard University called the Advanced Leadership Initiative, which helps people who have been successful in business transition to working on a social good. Before he finished the year-long program in Cambridge, he was sought out by BJC in Washington University to launch an early childhood program that would accomplish what Tom had envisioned serving families in need with a comprehensive long-term solution by using collective existing resources. He would be able to lead an effort that connected the dots without having to reinvent the wheel. So many stops along his journey were unexpected and seemingly coincidental. There was not a straight line from one point to the next, but Tom believes that everything happens for a reason. Reason, he learned through his Jesuit experience that, there, that we are to use our skills and talents for new opportunities that occur in our lives. He is always looking for what's next. Jesuits reinforced what his parents instilled in him about concern for others. 
Every person has dignity, regardless of their station in life. Everyone wants and deserves respect. And as we support others, we have to do things with them so that we don't adopt the attitude that we're rescuing them. Everyone you meet is there for a reason. Everything happens for a reason. And everyone has something to offer. Dr. Tiffany Anderson. Currently the superintendent of Topeka Public Schools and the first African-American woman to serve in the role, Dr. Tiffany Anderson is a SLU alumna twice over. She has served as a superintendent in public urban, rural, rural and suburban school districts for most of her 23 years in education and has been transforming communities through her phenomenal leadership. While serving as the superintendent of Jennings here in St. Louis, she reinvented the school district. She balanced the budget after a $2 million deficit. She restored accreditation to the district. She helped graduation rates soar. And she saw that 100% of her high school graduates were placed in college or careers. There's no doubt why she has been recognized by national leaders like Hillary Clinton for her accomplishments in education. In 2015, St. Louis University recognized Dr. Anderson with an Alumni Merit Award. She receives accolades, but she gives the credit to her team, teachers, parents, and students. She stated that what she did was give support. It's not one person, but collectively, people achieve great things. The spirit of Majus lives through her work. She sees equity and access to resources as the big biggest challenge. However, she believes that challenges create possibilities and build hope. With the goal of meeting the needs of families, she established a sustainable infrastructure, set high expectations, and monitored excellence. Her philosophy, Changing one's mindset is everything. The only barrier is yourself. During an interview, Dr. Anderson explained, if you look out of the box and look at every problem as an opportunity to be solved, a challenge uniquely designed for you, you can accomplish so many things. Her charge to us, do something. Invest in a public school, enrich the lives of children, and you will change the world. It's not coincidental that she and Tom Santel sh share the same message. It's not unlike the value St. Ignatius placed on education and how he translated that into action by establishing Jesuit schools that now stretch across the globe. These phenomenal alumni are simply three of thousands who are living the SLU mission. I firmly believe that because you've chosen to participate on this call today, you're an, you're an alumnus who has a heart for Jesuit values, and because of that, your life reflects it. If you have children, you're a leader. You're the most significant influence in their lives, and I bet you're teaching, teaching your children to be honest, to do what's right because it's the right thing to do, to be respectful and kind to others, to lend a hand and perform community service, to set goals, work hard, and be the best they can be. You're also living the, the mission as you show generosity, whether that's spending time with someone who has no one, giving financially to a nonprofit doing good work that aligns with your passion, volunteering in the community, or supporting your alma mater with your time and treasure. And on that note, I, I wanna pause and say thank you. Our alumni are extremely generous. SLU alumni actively engage with the university by sitting on boards, judging competitions, serving as guest speakers, recruiting our students, and the list goes on. And of course, you are generous with your finances. You donate tens of millions of dollars to the university to advance our mission. And for that, we are extremely grateful. 
And there are so many more examples, millions of more examples um, that show how you express your generosity. It's all a brilliant reflection on God, which brings him glory. So this is the final topic that we said we discussed today, and it's actually our final slide. How can each of us deepen our commitment to living out Jesuit values and promoting ethical leadership? First of all, keep doing what you're doing, and then think modest and do more. Encourage others to do. Mentor an aspiring leader. And how about letting the Emerson Leadership Institute tell your story? Our website will serve as a platform to showcase alumni who represent the essence of ethical leadership. We are producing short written and video profiles in a section called Living Ethical Leadership. If you would like to be featured, or if you know someone who would be an excellent candidate, candidate, please let me know. It has been a pleasure being with you today, and I hope that you're able to take away at least one nugget from this presentation. Before we go, I guess I'll um, just reach out and see if anyone has any questions for me. Thank you, Beth Ann. Um, so far, we have a couple questions, and I'll just read them off to you so you can have the opportunity to answer them. The first one is, um, can you give suggestions and tips on how to create a culture that promotes and encourages ethical behavior, just for those listening who might not be in leadership roles at, at this point in their career? Okay, that's a great question. And you know, I, I think it goes back to, can you mute? I can hear feedback. Can you mute? Sorry. It it really starts with how you interact with others. Even as someone who is not in a leadership role per se, you have influence. Your how you interact with your coworkers, how you show respect to your um, to your leaders, to your supervisors, how you handle pressure, how you react to pressure. All of those are very important because you are exhibiting um, uh, actions and examples that speak to your values. Because our, our ethics are basically how we act out and how we live our values. So having taking the time to self-reflect, to sit back and, and ask yourself, you know, what can I do? What, can I, what more can I do? Uh, what is going right? What is going wrong? How can I change those things? Having the time to, to sit back and have self-reflection will help guide that. I hope that answers your question. The only other things that are coming in is that people are asking for access to the slides. Okay. Um, so we did put up your information there, and you can probably email. On mute. Okay. I think you might be on mute. Okay. So the only other question coming in, oh, we do have a couple more coming in, but we do have questions about access to the slides. And we did just post up Beth Ann's email address. Would you prefer that they email you for that? I will provide you the slides and you can post okay. them on whatever platform works. Yeah, and I'll be emailing um, everyone after this and letting everyone know when the recording is available as well. So I'll attach the presentation in that slide. We do have one more that just came in. Um, it is, will you address leadership in volunteer community projects um, be addressed in a future webinar um, at all? That's an excellent idea, a suggestion. And if I am asked to speak on that topic, I would be happy to return. Okay, well, thank you everyone for joining us today. And additionally, on this last slide is my contact information. Um, if you or another SLU alum would be interested in being a presenter for a future professional development webinar, please just contact me directly via email. And our website is also up there 
um, as well that you can visit to look at any additional alumni professional development opportunities. But thank you, Beth Ann, for being our speaker today. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. We hope to see you at future webinars. Thank you. Thank you all very much.